Okay. So welcome to this presentation. I am Bruno Morel. I am a software director of INAP. Uh, we are a public company that uh, is using only OpenStack um, to provide the, the infrastructure. Hi, I'm Jean-Daniel Bonto. I'm from OVH. Uh, I'm technical evangelist. And I will give some details about uh, OVH and public cloud like Bruno. Uh, and my name is also Bruno. Uh, I'm from Catalyst IT. I'm the general manager of cloud computing there, but I started as a solution architect um, and have gone through the whole uh, process of Catalyst developing and uh, implementing a public cloud in New Zealand. And um, based on that experience, uh, I'm actually, uh, in the context of this presentation, I'm not representing the Catalyst public cloud. Uh, but instead, uh, OpenStack as a private cloud solution. So um, I was uh, helping these guys to develop a total cost of ownership model for uh, an OpenStack private cloud, so we can compare prices for um, for that with public cloud providers. So that's the subject today. So it's going to be: Can OpenStack beat Amazon Web Services in price? So it's reloaded because we did that presentation in Barcelona already. But we augmented it in island ma matrix, so that's why it's really reloaded. Just out of curiosity, how many of you were in Barcelona at that presentation? At that presentation? Cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was in Barcelona. Okay, cool. So that's, that's a big and complex subject. So the way that we approach it, because it's kind of an apple and oranges problem, is that we try to simplify a lot of the stuff. So we're going to start with just explaining the principles that we put forward to be able to compare those Apple and those oranges. Right. Can you, can you guys hear me now? Oh, yeah, better. Thank you. Um, so uh, what I want to show you, together with these slides, uh, at the end of the presentation, you guys will see a link in a QR code uh, to a Google Drive folder that actually contains the spreadsheets with the uh, calculations that we've done. Uh, to come up with these numbers, right? So the idea is for you guys to be able to, uh, you know, understand the assumptions, understand how we arrived at those numbers, and also make sure that whatever assumptions we've made uh, apply to your business or not and change and tweak it as, as you desire. Um, on this slide here, what we have, uh, just to show you, uh, for, for the private cloud, the total cost of ownership model, uh, what we are using as a reference there is a large private cloud, right? And by a large private cloud, I'm talking about something that will have uh, 300 compute nodes, uh, 50 object storage nodes, 40 block storage nodes, so something that has got a certain scale um, to the point where to run this cloud in production over a, over a period of three years, uh, you would be spending something like $11 million uh, for the whole thing, hardware people, power, uh, location space, and so on. Uh, but the important thing is uh, if you were uh, selling this capacity, uh, either internally uh, as a chargeback mechanism or actually as real money being transacted between companies with the margin, with the costs that we are using there, uh, you would actually recover uh, that $11 million. So what I'm trying to show here is that the numbers actually stack up and that we have a valid price model. Um, my intention there was not to add a margin for profit, it's a margin for cost recovery only. And the reason this is important is because when, when I'll, I'll be talking about the private cloud uh, numbers, I'm trying to show you what the bottom line is, right? What is the cheapest price that you would get at a certain scale uh, with OpenStack? Um, yep. So that, that was basically the first dimension that we looked at. What is the baseline? What is the minimum cost that you have if you just do it yourself? The second part was, was to use, of course, Amazon as a reference. There's a very interesting and useful tool that you probably already have used, which is called the simple monthly calculator for Amazon Web Services, where you just enter the kind of instances that you want, and you get to fill it all up correctly, and then you get an estimate of your bill. So inside that tool, there's a something that we think is very useful to uh, our, the point that we're trying to make. To make. It's basically there, there's a template of workloads. So we are using those templates that describe the different instances that Amazon consider a safe bet for that kind of workload as a standard, our, as our reference for the workload in question. 
So now, um, of course, we need to match up the different component that Amazon is using is a store uh, in, in our own uh, service offering. So the way we started is with the hardware. And first, the CPU, because you cannot compare prices if you don't have the same amount of calculability or computation uh, available to you. So the first, the CPU. The second was the RAM. Of course, you need to run those in somewhere. And the storage, uh, especially the type of storage. So if you compare SSD to spin disk, that's obviously not exactly fair to any of the providers that you are comparing with. So that was our first dimension. The second dimension was location. Um, so then again, it's really complicated. There's a lot of different regions in Amazon Web Services. Um, so we try to smoothen it up into the two main regions. Um, so that's um, going to be for uh, the US North Virginia, where you can find all the different services that Amazon provides and at the cheapest price possible from Amazon. And for Europe, we chose Frankfurt. But there's, there's a bit of nuances. Yep. And uh, about, uh, about location, as Bruno said, uh, location matters because uh, we will see in the following uh, use cases that uh, uh, a US provider like AWS will have better prices for the same product than uh, in US than in Europe. And for a uh, European provider, for the same product, you, you, the provider will have better prices in Europe than in US. This is the first uh, uh, con constat. And then uh, we have some explanation about the differences. Uh, the first is the uh, the first is the charges. When you run an instance in, uh, for example, in US, you will uh, you will consider the charges in the US, especially for ex electricity, bandwidth, hardware, and many other things. So an instance running in US is uh, based on the US charges, which are different different from the European ones and the New Zealand ones. That's the first uh, the first thing. And uh, there is something related to the uh, global strategy of the company because the prices could be based on where the workload is running or where the customer is based. And uh, this is uh, really related to the uh, company strategy and it's related to the US dollar value. So all these things are really complicated to uh, make together. Yeah. And uh, we tried to simplify everything. So what we did is, as you said, we took the region which are near or uh, as much as we can. And we translated, we converted all the prices in US dollar. Yeah, and so all the prices are in US dollar and we use the per hour pricing, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to have all the complication of dedicated instances, reserve instances, and the different dimension of monthly billing, yearly billing, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we would be happy to add that if you, if you want to look into the spreadsheet and be able to play with it. Yeah. And I just want to add one thing yeah. to that. Um, if you guys were at the last presentation in Barcelona, you may remember that um, I was actually using um, the New Zealand um, cost for hardware, uh, uh, transform it into US dollar, as, as our cost for you know, servers, uh, disks, and so on. And that's because back then, um, that's what I had access and, and, and knowledge about. But for this presentation, what I've done uh, is to actually come back to the US market and, and find for that bill of materials, the local prices for all those components that we use. So now the private cloud TCO model on that uh, drive, you will find that there is a version saying uh, US dollars uh, that's using uh, local hardware prices, right? Yep. And so the last part was what we call service and guarantees. So basically again, there's a lot of difference uh, of capabilities between all the different public cloud and even a, a private cloud if you, if you install it yourself. And Amazon also is delivering a lot of different services that we often doesn't have on OpenStack or not in a fashion that is multi tenant or in different ways and so on and so forth. So the way that we reduce the complexity with that is that we said for everything that was 
too complicated and too hairy, we would reduce it to the basic instances of so compute storage uh, and bandwidth um, that would be uh, pertinent for that workload. So for example, for a elastic load balancer, you don't need a big giant VM with a lot of RAM. So we match it up with an EC2 instance that would make sense for that workload. Um, what we did though, is that we added, uh, and we will talk about it a bit later, we added a bit of a sysadmin slash DevOps time to compensate for the work that you have to do that Amazon would be doing for you, okay? So that's the way that we make it fair is that we don't uh, use the services, so we have to uh, provide the capabilities to our customers slash developers, whoever they are. And in our use cases, it's mainly uh, the case for the database as a service. Yeah, yeah exactly, mostly. <laughs> So now, um, if we may, may take some example, and we, we, we won't be uh, going through all of those, again, there's a spreadsheet with all the numbers you can dream of. So I would strongly advise that you look at it, and we're gonna share the, the link to it. Um, but if we take the simplest of comparison, which would be one medium instance, um, it's gonna be for Amazon, one vCPU. So we're gonna match it, one vCPU for InterNAP, one CPU for uh, OVH and one vCPU for the private cloud. Same thing with RAM, and then it's starting to get complicated because Amazon does this thing, which is there's 3.75 gigabyte for the small configuration. So then again, it's difficult to match because we don't do 3.75 gigabyte. So we chose to go with the four gigabyte. That's kind of fair, okay? So for the 250 megabytes, that you're missing. So, uh, you. th this is an important part, point. Yeah. Every time there is a difference that we don't find, say, a flavor that matches precisely one and the other, what we're doing is to give um, Amazon the, the, um, um, the, the privilege, the advantage yeah. of going with the smaller instance. And on our side, we're choosing a flavor that is actually higher than that, right? Yeah. We're trying to be fair with that comparison as much as possible. So we should be expense, more expensive yeah. than in and we often are not. And last, and so it's storage, so the capacity itself, again, is not the same, but we make sure that it's always SSD when it's SSD. Okay, so that's an example. Uh, one other category, or maybe not, dun, 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 dun. something is not happening. Sorry, technical difficulties. Oh, there you go. Okay. It looks better. Yeah easier. Sorry for that. Okay, so a second example uh, would be a more complex and more um, complete hardware for, for example, a relational database. Um, so for example, for Amazon, that would be 16 vCPU, 30 gigabyte of RAM, and SSD with 320 gigabyte of storage. Um, on our side, we do bare metal on Ironic, on OpenStack. Um, so we match it up with something like 16 core, 32 gig, and a two terabyte R, uh, spin, uh, spin disk. Uh, that's the high, uh, high level spin disk with uh, red hardware. So it's fair in the sense that you can split it up and make a red array out of it. Uh, and for the VH, it's gonna be a big VM, so a B260 with 16 core, even more RAM, 60 gig of RAM, and around the same amount of SSD, and on the private cloud of things, part of things. <laughs> yeah, it's important to see that um, when I do the private cloud TCO model, uh, I don't really like this thing of bundling uh, storage into your compute prices. Uh, to me, compute is compute, storage is storage, and you can have them separate and buy you know, as much storage as you would like for your root volume, your ephemeral volumes um, in, in that. So you can see that all the private cloud prices, when we're talking about compute, it's pure compute, CPU and RAM. Uh, and then we have a separate charge for block storage, be it um, based on SSDs or a combination of SSDs and an, an NVMe cache uh, in front of it. Right. And for the OVH uh, instance here, the, uh, it's uh, 17 cores. It's uh, um, an instance without overcommits. That's, that's why uh, uh, 
we can say that the, the advantage is on the uh, AWS side because we had 70 cores here and uh, the resource is guaranteed. There is no, there is a, yeah, no over commit on the instance and it's not the case on the upper line. And last but not least, so the object storage, we're gonna compare S3 with Swift um, on uh, our side, on OpenStack, and EBS with Cinder and Ceph on uh, the private cloud. Yeah. So shall we? Right. So, go I'll, ahead. I'll cover the first one. So yeah. um, the, the first use case there is a simple marketing website. So uh, a really simple, um, uh, topology or architecture there, you have a load balancer, uh, which is an M1 small uh, compute instance. Uh, you have two uh, web application servers that are being load balanced, each one with four um, gigabytes of disk. You have uh, two terabytes of object storage, and you have one terabyte of um, outgoing uh, data transfer in that scenario. And as, as you can see, um, that's the monthly um, price if you were doing this with AWS, how much it would cost per year, and then the price for uh, internet OVH and the private cloud. Um, and you can see that the private cloud costs, assuming you have a large private cloud, uh, is much lower um, in, in this case. Yep. Uh, and you have one more. Yep. Yep. And, and, and you can see the difference um, between AWS uh, and the two OpenStack-based cloud providers for this scenario. So yeah, so you can see that just even for a small website that only have three nodes, some object storage, and a, quite a huge load of bandwidth, you are still uh, being uh, at an advantage if you choose OpenStack for your public cloud. And even if you can afford to have a private cloud, then you're even killing it, technically. And yeah. once again, we took the, we tried to simplify everything, so we took only the hourly prices. So even if you have a, a column with year, it's with the hourly prices On for, demand for AWS, instances. for each of us. Yeah. Yep. So you can even get even more rebate, but of course you could on Amazon, yeah. so yep. that's the way you compare. So if we look at the split. Yeah, this, this is important, right? So for every scenario we have there, you will find a, a breakdown of that cost. And you can see that the breakdown in this scenario, uh, you have 22% of the cost going for storage, 40% for compute, 37 bandwidth, and a little portion there for API requests on Amazon. But the reason we wanted to show this breakdown, uh, first of all, is to show you that a, a lot of times when people are doing, uh, comparing you know, their private cloud or their public cloud providers, they look at the storage cost, the compute cost, but they forget or don't estimate the bandwidth and the API requests. And actually, depending on your scenario, uh, your bandwidth in this case combined with the API requests uh, is about 40% there of, of your cost. So it's really important. Look at the bandwidth. Look at the API requests. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, is uh, it will give you, it will allow you to compare, you know, just the compute portion with the compute portion of the public cloud providers, for example. So it helps you to visualize that. Yeah. And so not only are we cheaper, but for most of the public cloud provider on OpenStack, there's a lot of different things that make the difference with Amazon. API requests being one, the bandwidth also being a, a big one. Um, so for example, us, we give you a huge load of uh, bandwidth quota, it's like in the 10 of terabyte per node. So that's huge, you can go uh, overboard wherever you want and you're basically unlimited. Yeah. So that makes a real difference even for the smallest of websites if you get the traffic that goes with it. So now web applications. So it's a bit of a more complex setup. It's a more classical setup. You get basically three web front with one load balancer, which is not redundant, it's not good, but that's the way it is into the, the template of Amazon. Um, you get two basically application, um, a web application server. So that's where you would be running your Apache, your PHP, your Python, your L, your whatever. Uh, with some storage, and then you get two uh, database, one big relational database, and one non-relational database, and some object storage. So that's a more, I'm consuming a lot of relational or non-relational uh, information, a bit of object storage, and the rest is dynamic and serving assets, basically. So what it gives you, again, is that if you look at the prices, um, you get a rebate wherever you choose 
as long as you go with OpenStack. Um, for us, that's going to be 10%. For AVH, it's going to be 20%. And of course, again, the private cloud, if you can afford it, is going to kill everything else <coughs> yeah. uh, down the, the drain. So a lot of people ask uh, why people are doing private clouds, right? Why, why people are still doing private clouds? And the reality is, <coughs> If you, have, if you have a certain scale and, and the need to, the cost that you can achieve with a private cloud compared to public cloud providers is still quite substantial. So yeah. that's one of the reasons people continue uh, to do private clouds. Uh, side footnote on this workload, uh, on the INA part, we are using the bare metal. So if you want to look into what does the difference make between a VM and a bare metal uh, price-wise, you can look at it. If we look at the split again, we see that on Amazon, the compute is getting large. Um, so the compute is getting large, you need a lot of RAM, and then it's going to cost you more and more and more. Uh, but one thing that you should not, and th in that case, we respected the template of Amazon where there's not much traffic on that uh, specific workload, which is a bit weird, but that's what you, they used, it, so we didn't change it. Uh, but still, the bandwidth and the API request are not unconsequential, okay? They are amounting about 3% of something that's already in the 10,000s of dollars per year. Um, so that's something that you, you have to look at, especially since if we look at the OpenStack provider, you won't be paying for that mostly. Um, the second thing that you can see on the split is that now we get big database um, so you would be using DynamoDB DB or, I don't know, something else. Uh, and so we added the DevOps time. Um, that's the small grill uh, part that you can see at the end of the, of the different splits for the different uh, providers. And still, with that amount of uh, sysadmin DevOps time, we are still cheaper than just using the APIs of Amazon. So think about it. Sometimes it makes more sense to not use those services. Yeah. Not necessarily more convenient though, right? Because ah, now, for sure now, now you need someone running that database on your behalf. Um, yeah. But I would expect that more and more OpenStack public clouds will have things like database as a service in production um, soon. Yeah. Now uh, that's the interesting slide for those of us that are uh, serving customers that are not in the US. Um, one of the things that OpenStack give you is choice. And what choice give you is that, for example, you have, if you have a provider that's specialized and that's based in Europe, or precisely in France, like OVH, then you can have a huge difference in the overall cost that your infrastructure may have on Amazon and on an OpenStack provider. Uh, for example, in that case, with OVH, you would pay $9,000 in the US, because and it's even cheaper than Amazon, but then, and if you look at the European price, you would pay 20% less even. Um, and for us on our side, in INAP, we don't uh, make a, a difference in the, the two prices. Which is good too. Yeah, <laughs> which is good because it's already cheaper than Amazon. So just think about the fact that by having choice, you can choose the right provider. There is provider in China, there's provider in New Zealand, there's provider in Australia, with using OpenStack, you are not dependent on Amazon deciding to have a region on your backyard. You can choose whichever providers have used the best for the best price, which is a huge difference. Mm. And one <coughs> of the most interesting one is the mobile application workload. So there's a huge traffic. That's a mobile app, so it's basically an app that's asking for API's answer every minute. Uh, there's, of course, a bit of a web front because you need those APIs to answer in HTTP. But there's uh, two big instances of database, two big instances of non-relation in database, your MongoDB, whatever, and a huge load of object storage. And then again, if you look at the overall picture, you'll see that if you choose OpenStack, you get a 15 to 25% rebate just by using a technology that's open and free. Um, not only could you use the public cloud of OpenStack, but you could use a private cloud of OpenStack, and then you will even divide the price by basically 90%.
So if we look at the splits again, and now it's getting interesting, there's a, a bit of bandwidth that's going on, and so we are talking about $25,000 a year, and 17% uh, of $25,000 a year is not something that you want to just throw out of the window. Um, the compute, again, on Amazon is still priced in, in a way that it makes it the most costly part of your bill. The storage is not so much important, but there you can see that bandwidth and API requests are starting to make a difference. So the more you are really using your services and the more it costs you, and if you choose OpenStack, then you're gonna not have to pay for that. At least all the public cloud providers that I know of don't make pay you for the API request and even most of the bandwidth. And again, uh, in the case of OVH, just uh, anecdote, I think it's the storage, the communication between the storage and the instances, am I right? For the, the two percent? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And just to be fair, uh, as the Catalyst Cloud in New Zealand, we do charge for uh, bandwidth data transfer uh, because we are in New Zealand um, and, and um, network um, traffic there is expensive compared to other countries. So it's an important cost component for us. Yeah. If we look at the location again, um, Huge difference, so for Amazon, you would pay 10% more in Europe, so which means that if you want to be near your user, you would have to pay more, when if you choose OpenStack, you would have the uh, opportunity to choose OVH, where you would be paying 20% less. Compared to their US price. Compared to the, to OVH the US, US price, price. Yes. Yes. correct. Yes. It's correct. not 10% of the OVH yeah. price, yeah. Good. Um, so again, Amazing difference. Yep. Archiving. The last use case about archiving. So just one word about our uh, services, uh, on our public cloud archive service. Uh, we built this service few weeks ago. We prodded it a uh, few, few weeks ago. And uh, in fact, it's based on Swift. Uh, and it's, uh, you can address this archive, your archive accounts with a Swift API, classic Swift API, or you can do it with um, SCP protocol, SFTP protocol, or AirSync. Uh, yeah, and it, in fact, it works like AWS Glacier. Uh, you can push your data to the, to the uh, archive service, and when you need to uh, recover your data, you have to uh, work them up, make a call to work them up, wait uh, a certain time, and then when the data is available, you can get your data, like in, the, in AWS Glacier. So in this use case, we have uh, the situation uh, of a huge system, and we want to uh, archive all the logs. So every month, we have uh, 500 gigabytes, five new 100 uh, gig gigabytes, uh, and we want to push it on the, on the archive service. And uh, if you do it for 10 years, you will have 70 terabytes. 60? 60. 60, sorry. 60, yep. 60 terabytes. <laughs> and uh, for the outgoing traffic, we estimate that uh, the situation requires something like, <laughs> sorry, uh, 50 gigabytes for log analysis when you want to get the log and al analyze something or, yes. So, uh, yes, the prices, so as you can see, we are uh, cheaper than AWS, one more time, by 25%. And here the interest and the, the interesting things is that uh, the green part is what you are interested in. You want to pay for the storage, right? For when you use an archive service. So here, you can see that you really pay for a storage. This situation is the situation after 10 years of archiving logs. So that means that you are already uh, have uh, 60 terabytes uh, of data in the service. And here you can see that the bandwidth, the API request is not really important in the budget. But if you, if you do this uh, cal calculation for the first year, for example, you won't have the 70, uh, 60 terabytes already in the service. 
So you will, you will have the bandwidth and the API requests, which will, will represent maybe half of the budget, a really big uh, you know, part of, the, your, of, your, of your budget. Um, Can I say something? Yeah. Um, I just want to acknowledge that it's no small feat. I, I remember when uh, Glacier uh, became available and we were all very, very impressed with the cost per gigabyte for archiving data in Glacier. Um, and to me, it's no small feat that um, OVH yeah. managed to uh, create a solution um, that can compete in, 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 in cost with Glacier. So I, I think on behalf of everyone here, we would like to say congratulations for you guys for doing so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and at the same time, um, now, where in my community head, I'm really interested in seeing whatever changes you guys have made to Swift, uh, hopefully uh, being open source and becoming uh, part of Swift upstream as well, yeah. uh, because it looks like a really good contribution uh, to the Swift yeah, project. Yeah. We are working on that, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> um, the one dollar. Yeah, <laughs> as you can see on the last line, for AWS, uh, like previously, you have uh, a huge difference between uh, US and Europe. And for, uh, for OVH, you can see that there is one dollar uh, between US and Europe. So if you want to choose, maybe you can, you can, you can buy a coffee with this one dollar if you go to <laughs> Europe. Uh, to the Free coffee Europe. from OVH. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, OK, so oops, OK. So, uh, can OpenStack beat Amazon on price? I would say that yes, it is possible. Not only it is possible, but honestly, the more I look at it, and I would say that it's even easy. What you have to remember is that the cost is not just the cost that you can see on the website. The cost is your workload cost. So if you take a holistic approach, you get to pay for that bandwidth, and the more you consume it, it's gonna to amount to a, a certain price that's gonna be different than what you thought about. And those API calls, again, they are not free. So you get to take them into account. Unless, if you're using OpenStack, most of those goes away or are reduced in a very important fashion. So we wanted to leave you with something to think about, is that not only is it important to look at it at a short-term uh, span, but also a, as a long-term investment. So this is my ideal idea of what should be the curve of any company. So you get no experience in what you are trying to, to put on the, on, the, on the web, and so you get to learn. And what happens is what I call, you enter the purely public cloud Iceland of rainbows, so you want to, you know that Amazon is easy, you want to use it, it's fun, there's a lot of APIs, it's restful, it's super fun, you love it, and you get two VM to run. So it's okay, you can use VMR maybe if you do some map reduce and stuff like that. May I say that everything you said also applies to OpenStack, right? RESTful yes. API, it's fun yes, to use. Yes, and yes. That's, that's, you got, yeah. We all are included in the public yeah, cloud exactly. uh, slice there, right? Just and to be clear. And then life gets complicated. Good. Either you are on Amazon or any other public cloud provider, and so you're starting to enter what I call the hybrid land of chaos, where you try to optimize your workload. So do I need a medium here? No, I don't. I want a small here. It makes more sense. So I'm going to optimize for that. Or I want a bare metal there because that's the workload I know that I, I need it. And I know that you need to compute all this, the, use all the CPUs. I'm going to put a bare metal here. And last but not least, if you go that far, um, you, you're going to enter the, what I call mostly private cloud of mountain of wise old wizards. Um, so you enter the cavern and you basically at some points want to do it yourself because you get the money to be able to do it, you get the money to maintain it, and so you're asking yourself, why, do I, why am I paying someone else to do it for me? You can still have good reason 
to, to keep it on the public cloud. But my point is just, at some point, you're going to ask yourself that question. Well, I, I actually would like to provide an example. Uh, yeah. You guys probably remember the story uh, with, with Dropbox, right? So Dropbox started on top of Amazon AWS using uh, pretty much only their infrastructure. Eventually, they got to the point where they had some hybrid. Some, some of their servers were running outside the cloud. And on Amazon, it was pretty much just the object storage part of it. Uh, and a few years ago, I think now, I don't remember exactly the date, uh, they decided, OK, no, we, we're too big. We understand too much about running you know, object storage in, in a system to store uh, documents. We're pulling out of the public cloud and building our own uh, private cloud for, for Dropbox. And now they run their own infrastructure. Right? So eventually, you see this pattern of successful startups growing to the point where they develop the experience uh, and also the volume. Um, to, to say it's more cost efficient and, and strategic for my business to run my own infrastructure. And that's when they enter into the uh, it's, private. It's really related to the volume, yes. Yeah, and it's important. The volume is important, right? Uh, if there is one thing that I would like to say in relation to that is uh, if you are building an OpenStack private cloud to run one computing sense uh, or a handful of virtual machines and you had the cost that I'm talking about of a large private cloud of $11 million, I'm sorry, but that makes no sense. By right? the uh, and also, um, to, to be honest, you don't need an OpenStack uh, private cloud with 300 compute nodes for the numbers to stack up. Right? But you, you need a certain volume. Maybe if you have uh, 500 you know, virtual machines, 1,000 virtual machines, that's when it justifies doing a private cloud where the numbers start to stack up and compare well with your public cloud providers. So one thing that I need to be honest uh, as of, sorry, is that the curve is a lie. So the curve really looks a bit more like that. Yep. Okay, so for a long, long time, you won't and probably shouldn't uh, look into um, <coughs> a private cloud because, as Bruno said, you get to incur the cost, you get to incur the management cost, you get to uh, you know, train people and put that project uh, forward and be able to manage that project. It's not something that's trivial. Um, and at some point, you're going to have to pay for that. That's yep. not free. Um, and so if you want to enter the mountain of what is old withered, there's a ticket fee for yeah. that. If that, you can't afford it, that's amazing for you. I'm happy. That spike there is your project to implement your private cloud, right? Yeah. So you will have the cost of hardware, which could be a capital, invest, uh, a capital investment or you, you financing hardware, it doesn't matter. You have the effort of that project. Uh, and then after you cross that point, maybe you will get the benefit. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I uh, didn't say in the last presentation that I wanted to say on this one is uh, there is a risk associated with that, right? And the risk is, is your company capable of attracting the right people, developing the knowledge, the experience required, and retaining these people for a while? Because one of the reasons people go to public cloud providers like these two guys here um, is because it has already been done for you, right? There is no risk associated with the project. That project is success successful, it's running in production, and you just go and consume it. So the question is, how successful or what are your chances of succeeding with a private cloud implementation? And that's when I really like uh, what I see with uh, companies like Mirantis, for example, reinventing themselves and following what other companies are doing and saying, I'll deploy and manage an OpenStack cloud remotely for you. Because what they are doing with that is to increase your chances of succeeding with that project yeah. right? and minimizing that business risk. So basically smoothing up this, this curve. A little bit this curve. In the end. Good. So very happy to have to share that uh, with you. So I'm Bruno Moral, this is Bruno Lago, and Jean-Daniel Bonteau. We are accessible on Twitter, the internet, wherever you want, uh, you can reach out. We'll be super happy. <laughs> Any comments you may have, or if you want to have precision, details. Um, so Bruno is more <coughs> at ease with the TCO model for the private cloud. Me, NGD, we are very aware of the public cloud part. If you get any question, you want to run a specific workload into the spreadsheet, please go check it out. It's yep. there. It's available. It's open source. Yep. Um, it's on Google Drive, though, because yep. there's no spreadsheet online that's available for OpenStack yet. So Open source one. I, I do want to ask a favor for you guys. Uh, number one, on the last summit, uh, we had some really good comments and improvements suggested by the community on, on that spreadsheet. It is licensed under Creative Commons, so we can all collaborate on this. Uh, and the second thing is, you may have noticed that for things like the archiving scenario, uh, I haven't developed or put, put their uh, uh, TCO model for the archiving um, um, use case. 
So one thing maybe we should do for the next summit is to work together in creating a few uh, other offerings in there. I would like to see the archiving scenario covered. I would like to see costs for databases as a service, costs for other services in OpenStack uh, being defined uh, in, in there. So if you're interested in this space, please join me and help us to uh, do these calculations and provide that model to the community. Yeah, and if you are from a public cloud provider, we are welcoming anybody to put their numbers in here. Um, that the whole goal is to be fully transparent. Um, most of the public cloud provider has to display the price, so we can just put them there. Yep. Um, of course, we won't be doing that for them. That would be probably insulting, especially if, it's, if the price is different. So we invite everybody to try to participate into that. Even if you are a public cloud in New Zealand or even on the moon, okay. feel free to do it. That's the, is the that your next region? Yeah. <laughs> Secret. <laughs> right. That's it. That's our time. Thank you very much, guys.